<laughs> don't, don't, don't go there, Mark. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to have everybody here. Shana Tova, Happy New Year. Hag Sameach, Happy Holidays, and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Um, welcome back. It's good to see everyone for the new year. Um, here's what we have. The, um, th this morning is called Shabbat Cholamoy Sukkot, and the tradition in synagogues around the world for many, many thousands of years is to study a very special book, the book of Kohelet. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The, um, this morning, following our Torah study, you're invited as a sweet kid's bar mitzvah and followed by lunch outside in the sukkah. We have two sukkahs. Actually, I have five sukkahs here at VBS, but there's two. Whoa. Well, right. come on. It's a from shul, you know. <laughs> so there's the big one in the front, and there's one on the patio. You're all invited to come and join that. Um, and then uh, this week, we have uh, uh, the, the holiday begins again on Wednesday night. Thursday morning, the Yisker prayers, Yisker prayers are recited uh, for Shemini Atzeret. Thursday night is Simchat Torah. There's a Simchat Torah for small kids beginning at 5.30 and for the community at large at 7. And everyone is invited to a celebration of Torah. And then Friday morning, we do it all over again with Hakafot. And then Friday night, next Friday night, is the... Uh, the first Rimonim service of the season, musical Shabbat. And next Shabbat is Shabbat Breshit. We turn the Torah back to the beginning and start all over again. So it's a, a nice celebration. Um, the uh, couple of, the uh, College of Jewish Studies, our Wednesday night lecture series will begin on the 18th, uh, which is a week from Wednesday night. The sur the, this year we're going to do a survey of Jewish history. Uh, our friend David Myers, who's the teacher of Jewish history at UCLA, published a very short, it's literally called a short introduction to Jewish history, and we'll use that as a sort of text, and we're going to do it uh, by, by ages and periods. So we'll start with the biblical age, and then rabbinics, medieval, and modern, and we've invited some wonderful teachers from around the country to come and uh, to join us. So thir uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, it's free, and we serve cookies. So what, what could be bad? Um, this year, uh, on the, let's see, I think it's the 15th, the, the, the 15th of December is Rabbi Showweiss's yard site. Um, and our guest this year will be Rabbi Yitz Greenberg uh, and his wife, Mrs. Blue Greenberg. Um, Yitz and Blue are dear friends of the rabbi. Um, he's a wonderful teacher, um, orthodox rabbi, wonderful teacher of Jewish ideas. His new book coming out. Uh, doesn't travel very much anymore, but for us, he decided he'd come. So we get to spend a whole weekend with Yitz and Blue Greenberg. Um, Blue will be doing the Neshama Minyan that weekend, and Yitz will be teaching the congregation, so you'll have a schedule of all that. So these are just some previews of coming attractions um, of things that are, are happening in the shul, okay? Um, for those who asked, and I do appreciate it, uh, Dad moved to a new place. Uh, he's out of the rehab, where it, which is good because he was sort of miserable there, and he moved to a boarding care on Victory Boulevard, a, wet, a block west of Fallbrook. On the north side of the street, it's, it's be between Westlake and Fallbrook. Yeah, it's, it's 23259 Victory. I'll put that up someplace. If anybody would like to go visit him, he'd love to have visitors. He's, uh, he's, he's kind of lonely, and if you have a minute and can drop over, it would mean a lot. And we're hoping that he continues to recover uh, physically. He's doing a lot of physical therapy. He's feeling better, so thank you for your prayers and your thoughts. And the other one is that a uh, member of our synagogue community, Andrew Pelter, who's our our tech guy, uh, his niece was shot in Las Vegas. Um, she, she's okay. She, 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 she had to, the, the worst part was that they rushed her to the hospital, but because there were so many people in such bad shape, they had to keep her waiting before they could do the surgery. Um, they eventually did a surgery. The bullet went in through her lung, cracked a couple of ribs, messed up her internal organs, but she's being patched up. She's a strong kid. And it looks like she's going to recover uh, from this. So our prayers with her and with all the families of those who were both lost and hurt. Um, terrible, terrible thing. Uh, but she's doing OK today. So that, that's the good news, OK? Um, that's about all the news I can think of, unless anybody has any other. Any? Yes, please, yeah. I just have a question. Yeah. Can you stand on one foot and say something that I consider my autobiography? No. <laughs> She wanted to know if I could say something about Las Vegas. On one foot. You know, the problem is anything you say, is that someone's going to take it the wrong way. Um, the, the crazy thing is it doesn't fit any of the patterns. I 
I don't mean that. No, no, I'm sorry. We're trying to, human beings try to assimilate random events into meaningful structures. We always do this. That's why, if you've ever seen on the street, they have two of those warning lights and they're flashing an opposite, you, they tend to form a pattern in your head. We like to form patterns. So if we say the guy was a Muslim radical, you say, well, that's evil, but at least it fits a pattern, right? If you say he was a white supremacist, you say that fits a pattern. There's no pattern. No one can figure out why this guy did this. And I no, I know it is. Yeah, no, I don't think this is God's doing. God puts us in the world and gives us a choice about how, what kind of human beings we'd like to be and what kind of societies we'd like to build, okay? Personally, I think personally, this is personally, I understand, I understand all of, the, all of the need for Second Amendment liberties, and I understand people's need to own guns, and I understand all of that stuff. I don't understand why anybody in America needs a military-style assault rifle. Um, if you want to go shoot deer, go shoot deer, or squirrels, or chickens, or bears and use one of those big sport rifles. But I don't know why you need an AK-47 to do I never met a hunter who needed an AK. If you need an AK-47 to stop a deer, you're not a very good hunter, right? You know, so now, but this week, the National Rifle Association agreed to sign on to the, to the uh, prohibition on bump stop uh, stocks, which to me is interesting, because that means that they admit that the weapon had something to do with it. Why not go farther and just say, as Bra the Brady people did, that you don't need a saw rifle. Ellie, come in and get, let's get some ch chairs, this place. This place to sit over here. Nebuch, you shouldn't sit in the hall. Come inside. That's me. Look, I'm just an old-fashioned guy. I'm, you know, I'm seriously, so I, come in, this place over here, really. Um, plus, people, people do evil. I mean, people get evil ideas. This guy, and from all the indications of the news this week, he scouted this out, tried it out in three different places, considered different. Yeah, who knows? Who knows what's in the guy's head? I, I have no idea. It's not a divine experience. This is a human thing. Can we prevent it? Probably not. Can we make it a little harder for some guy? Probably. And so this is where it is. Uh, you know, you look at it and you shake your head and you say, hmm. So when you're talking to God about this, is that what you're Yeah, I say, you know, I, I say, you know, give us the wisdom to be able to figure out a way to create a society that doesn't generate loony, lunatics like this and take away some of the means of murder. I don't know how to do, you know, there were more people killed in Chicago last week than there were in Las Vegas. That's a harder issue. I mean, if you read the Adam Winkler's uh, a wonderful column in the LA Times yesterday, he's a law professor. He said, listen, the real problem with gun violence isn't this. It's the daily toll of suicides, accidents. Th these sorts of things, so that impresses me. So, I, I, but I, you know, yeah, please. I, I don't want to get into this. That's not why we came today. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and violence is a fantasy that this is the solution to your issues, and violence is, yeah, this is another piece of it. You know, yeah. Yeah. The people that didn't know somebody and helped them go from a truck to the next. Right. Perfect strangers. Right. That's what he would see. Well, you, you would see the heroism and the, of the first responders, the heroism of concert goers. You'd see the heroism of people who, who and the, the medical personnel. Who, and th that's part of the, that's also part of the, the story. But I, I can't account for this on the one hand, and I, and I'm, I'm, very humble about making policy recommendations because I'm not an expert in these areas. That actually made I, me feel better. I read this stuff, I read this stuff, and I, like you do, and I respond. I just, just, it's hard. Okay, uh, um, let, let's, let's jump, unless anyone has another pressing. Yeah, please. Well, I wanted to ask you, when you brought up about the, uh, the mistaken perceptions of violence as warfare, I just wanted to ask you, have you ever thought about that, like, violence is almost like, not, not idolatry, but, you know, this mistaken idea that you get rid of someone or you get rid of a group of people, and that's like externalizing a responsibility. I was wondering if that's common in your art tradition or art tradition. No, not in art tradition. I mean, I, I would say that art tradition wages a war against binary thinking. Us, them. Our people, those people. 
Now that doesn't mean that Jews don't have that in them, because I think it's a human response, but I think the best of the Torah tradition tries to respond to that and understand that at echad is the word. There's a unity of humanity, human experience. But you know, as human beings, we tend to want to divide the world into us and them, right? Our people and those people, the people who belong and the people who don't belong. And then you have this thing about, well, the people who don't belong, let's just push them out. Let's, let's, let's castigate them, let's blame them, let's push them out, let's eliminate them. That, I think, is a deeply held human pattern of experience. Um, little kids play cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians, right? They, they like to play. You know, when I was a kid, there was the thing when I was young, you know, the mommies came in and took away all of our war toys. So we went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> go ahead, take this away, you know? I mean, <laughs> this is how we are. I mean, this is, I think this is a deeply held human response. The question is, can you, can you teach Culturally, can you, can you undermine that and teach people to see solidarity with the other, in, 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 with the other who's different than them, in, in, from a, from a culture, in a culture? And that's a very difficult thing to do, even in Jewish culture, right? We have an exquisite vocabulary for who we're not. Goyim, shiksa, shege, I mean, I can give you 800 words, you know, that my bubby would use to express, you know, who she's not, you know, who we're not. We're, this is the, that's the human part of it. But there's a tr deeply held tradition that, you know, a deeply held value trying not to see the world that way. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's worth a sermon one day. Okay? Yeah, please. So, um, your daughter comes in and says, can I stand? I'm going to a concert. I see her now. I love it. Right. She has children at home. Oi, <laughs> never. <laughs> How do you deal with it? Yeah. Right, because you're dealing in a world which is out of control. The, the, look at the very beginning of Genesis. We'll read it next week, right? The world was unformed and void. And God hovered over the spirit of the deep, over the darkness of the deep, and God said, let there be light. So the, the religion exists because human beings need to make order out of chaos. When you experience chaos, it, give, it gives you a very primal sense of being out of control. My world is not predictable. And if my world is not predictable and it's out of control, it's no longer my home. I feel out of place, out of home in my own world. I can't count on anything in my own world. And that's a terrifying re reality. It is an absolutely terrifying reality. And so you seek ways of trying to find a new order or a different order or a higher order. Sometimes People will say, I mean, there are, there are religious people who say it's all in God's hands, which is a way of creating order out of chaos and say this is intended. There are those of us who say, I wouldn't worship a God who did this sort of stuff. And that puts us back in the chaos game. So then you say, well, and I, I look to the, to the activities of those who heal as an example of divinity in the world. That gives me some sense of the, the moral value that's possible. I, you know, this is the human condition. The human, this is unetan et tokef, right? This is that prayer we read, right? Right? Mi chiyo, mi amut, mi bekitzo, mi lo bekitzo, who's going to live and who's going to die? And, and it's all written in God's book, and we have nothing to do about it. You know, and then at the end of the prayer, it says, shuvat filet tzedakah, and then it doesn't even say what it's supposed to say, because the original text was shuvat filet tzedakah, repentance and prayer and tzedakah. The original text was mivatlina tagzera. That will cancel God's decree. But somewhere in the Middle Ages, people realized it don't work. So they changed it to mavirinit roa It mitigates it. It ameliorates it. It makes it a little better. Because you, this is the human condition. The human condition is you live in a world which is fundamentally out of control. We create pockets of control, pockets of home, pockets of predictability. You become very aware of, those of, of the value of those pockets of predictability when things like this happen. Most of us go to concerts and don't get hurt. You know? And think about the thousands and thousands and thousands of people you interact with, and somehow we all abide by a common social code that protects us. It's a remarkable thing. But sometimes this chaos breaks through the world. And when it does, it hurts. So you grieve. 
and you mourn and you seek wisdom and you seek the comfort of a community. You seek tshuva tila tzedakah. You, you seek a, a, a different way to think about the world. That, that's, that's, that's the human condition. That's what we spent all Yom Kippur beating our chest about. And then to the extent that you and I contribute to it, that's our sin. That's what we have to be careful about. Uh, that, uh, let, let's go to this now. Is that OK? All right, so really quickly. So let, let's, let's talk about where we are in the Jewish year. We're in an extraordinary spot. So we've done this before, but let's catch up. Israel, like California, has no river. Ancient civilizations were built by rivers. Right, the, the Nile in Egypt, Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, the Mississippi and Missouri in North America, the Amazon in South America, the Yangtze in China, right, the Rhone, the Rhine, the Danube in Europe. Great rivers gave great civilizations because you had a common source of water. So you could irrigate crops, build a, a surplus of wealth, and have enough people around to create culture. You weren't subsistence farming. It gave you transportation so you could have trade. It gave you transportation so you could have cultural exchange. Rivers were the soul of ancient civilization. Our civilization, we're the one except one of the great exceptions. We're not built on a river. There's a river in Israel called the Jordan. Ech. That's like the LA River. You know, it's like <laughs> Nebuch, you call that a river, you know. It's not a river, it's a it's a stream, a gully, a, yeah, bleh, you know. There's no river, so you're depending on rainfall. When you depend upon rainfall, you live with a degree of dependence, a sense of vulnerability. Either it's going to rain or it ain't going to rain. California, right? Either it's going to rain or it's not going to rain. If it rains, I'm going to have plenty to eat. If it don't rain, I'm in big trouble. That sense of dependency is one of the fundamental factors of Jewish culture. Now, just like California, Israel doesn't have four seasons, it has two, a wet season and a dry season. When you have the seam lines between those two seasons, wet and dry, dry and wet, we have holidays. Religious cultures decorate doorways. Doorways are considered spiritually dangerous because the moment you walk through a doorway, there's a split second in between when you're neither here nor there. In either in nor out, and that split second is dangerous. So religious traditions decorate doorways. Literal doorways, we put up mezuzahs. Buddhists put up prayer flags. Muslims paint them in aqua green. Many, cult all cultures, all, I would say all religious cultures, do something on doorways, right? Americans have burglar alarms. This is how, <laughs> this is how, no, it's a ritual. You come in, you push the button. No, I come in, I push the buttons, the thing stops beeping, right? Does it really protect my house? Eh, maybe, you know. But at least it's my ritual. I'm home, you know? It, 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 not just doorways literally, but doorways of lifetime. Whenever there's a transition, when a couple goes from single to married, we decorate that with ritual. When a, when a family welcomes a child, the child has gone from non-being to being. We welcome that child with ritual. And when one of us goes from being to non-being, when there's a death, we, we decorate those moments with ritual. When a child goes from childhood to adulthood, we decorate and protect those moments with ritual. Similarly, in the, in the, in the, in the lifetime, of the, the experience of us all, there's rituals for the morning, when you go from night to day, and rituals for the night, when you go from day to night. There's rituals when the seasons change. You see? So when the seasons change, we have two sets of rituals. In the spring, when we go from the wet season to the dry season, because it's been raining all spring and we know we're going to have a great harvest in the fall, you have a series of happy holidays. You have Purim. Well, first you have Tu Bishvat, but you have Purim, which is the holiday where everything turns upside down. Then you, four weeks later, you have Pesach, which is the holiday of the high brisket costs, right? <laughs> And, and liberation from slavery. And then you have seven weeks later, you have Shavuos, the giving of Torah, the meaning of freedom, freedom from and freedom to. Then in the fall, when we go from the dry season to the wet season, and there is some anxiety about, is it going to rain? How, how do we know it's going to rain? And rain was considered a gift. So we have to ask for forgiveness for the sins that might keep the rain from falling. So you have a series of holidays. You have the month of Elul, which is the month of reflection followed by Rosh Hashanah, 
which is not a, an unhappy holiday, but it's a reflective New Year's. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an exuberant New Year's. So we have Rosh Hashanah, then 10 days later, you have 10 days of repentance, 10 days of self-examination and self-improvement. Then you have the high point, which is Yom Kippur, which is really a day of, of rehearsal of death. I spoke about this on the holiday, where you're going to surround yourself with the images of death because you want to remind yourself that being in the world is vulnerable. It's a fragile business, being a human being. And, and you pray for forgiveness and for wholeness. And then four days later, we have a new holiday. Now, this is bad calendaring. Anyone could have told you that. But it, it actually functions as a unit because the next it's a nine-day holiday that starts out with Sukkot and ends up with Simchat Torah. Now, Sukkot, which is where we are right now, is such an interesting holiday. It's the only holiday you do with your whole body, right? On Shavuos, you learn Torah, and on Pesach, you sit at a Seder and stuff your face with matzah. But here, the mitzvah is literally leshev bas sukkah, to put yourself in a sukkah. Think of it as the hokey pokey. You put your whole self in, you know? You don't take your whole self out. You put your whole self in, and you shake it all about. And shaking it is what we do, because the sukkah has to be a little shaky. Because the sukkah represents three things. A, it represents the booths we lived in when we crossed the desert, the vulnerable condition of those freed slaves who were, who were only at God's mercy that they survived, B, the farmer who goes out to his field to gather in his crops and understands that no matter how well he farms, there is always an element of contingency in this world. You don't know if they're going to come in well or not come in well, those crops. And see, it, it represents, therefore, it represents the human condition. The sukkah represents the human condition. And the notion is that if you're in a building with a roof, you could think to yourself that this is my world, that you shrink the world down to your own capacities and competencies. I control my own existence, right? I even have a box on the wall, which if it's working, I can control the temperature in here, and I can control the lights in here. And I, think I have this conceit, this arrogance, that I control the conditions of my own existence. So once you go outside, you're supposed to not just visit the sukkah, you're not supposed to even eat it, you're supposed to live in it for a week. And if you left your nice house, you know, in Tarzana or Encino, Reseda, Van Nuys, and you went outside and you lived in a sukkah, and especially if you didn't live in California, you would discover that whatever happens in the world happens to you. If it's cold, you're going to be cold. If it's hot, you're going to be hot. If it rains, it's going to rain on you. If it blows, it'll blow you over. You're actually at the mercy of the, of, of the, of the elements, and it, it, it destroys this arrogance that I am the master of my own destiny. I'm the master of very little. I can't even keep the sun off my face. It, it, there really is a sense of the vulnerability and that you live in nature, and you're a creature of nature. Now, the, the, the balancing idea is that as a creature of nature, I get to enjoy the gifts of nature. So you're supposed to sit in your sukkah and feast. And it's really the only holiday where you use all your senses. Jews have this crazy thing that we don't really have bodies, you know? Otherwise, how could you write a high holiday service that's five hours long? I mean, who the hell can sit for five hours? Now, I certainly can't, right? I get numb, you know? I mean, it's just, your body starts to wear out after. But, you know, so you're supposed to send your spirit and brain to shul and your body stays home in bed, right? A lot of Jews do that. I don't know if you know that. The shul is full. I mean, it's full. The bodies are all home in bed, but all the spirits are in the sanctuary. <laughs> but, 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 but here is a holiday which says you have to go outside and be in the sukkah. You have to smell the grass. You have to see the roof and the stars above you. You have to feel what it's like. You have to eat. It's a really, it's the most sensual holiday. So as contrasted with Yom Kippur, when you didn't have a body, today it's all body. It's all feasting. It's all feeling, right? And in contrasted with Yom Kippur, when Torah was so heavy, when religion is so heavy, this is a holiday that has a, a sort of bittersweet quality, a little bittersweet quality, because it's sort of sense of, you know, okay, there's what to enjoy being a human being. And we end with Simchas Torah, you pick up the Torah and you dance. So this, one of my friends called this a halfway house. You know, if, 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 the 10 days of repentance from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur are this very deep introspection when you're tearing the self to bits. And on Yom Kippur, you sort of break down everything. You give it your all at Nila. 
Well, now, before you can go home to the normal life, you've got to stop someplace and sort of recover a sense of being human. And that's what the sukkah is. That's what we're going to be doing during Sukkot. Now, in the, min the middle of all that, we have this marvelous book, which the tradition offers us to read. Which, and, and so one of the questions is, like, what does this book have to do with this holiday? The book doesn't mention the holiday. There are five short books at the end of the Hebrew Bible. They're all assigned to holidays. Some of it makes sense. Esther is assigned to Purim, because it's the story of Purim. And Lamentation, which is Echa, the story of the destruction of Jerusalem, is assigned to Tisha B'Av, because that's the holiday you commemorate that. And then you have a little, some more tenuous things, right? Shir Hashirim, which is an erotic love poem, is assigned to Passover, because after two nights of matzah, who isn't in the mood for love, <laughs> right? You know, and then you get, um, you know, and, and then Ruth is assigned to Shavuot, because it's a holiday of the giving of Torah, and here's a woman who accepts Torah. It also takes place at the barley harvest. This one is a very interesting commentary on the Sukkot experience. We'll see that as we get to the end, okay? It's also a very, very challenging book. So I'll give you just the end of the story, because you may fall asleep between now and then. There's two schools of thought about what the heck this is doing in the Bible altogether. Because you'll read it and say, huh? Why is, who let this in in the Bible? It's completely contrary to everything else that's in the Torah. It's a real, it's a real contradiction of Torah, at least Torah ideology. And you'll say, how did this get here? So there's two ways to read it. One way to read it is to say, no, it really is a confirmation of Torah ideology, because the last line of the book, which I failed to give you, says, in the end, all you can do is fear God and do his mitzvot. And so there is a certain school of traditional thinking that said, well, that's the upshot of the whole book. And then there's another way to read it, which is ironic. And this is more, the more modern way to read it, which is there's something ironic about this, which is what, what's important here is not what's said, but what's not said. And at the end, I'm going to ask you, new, how did this get into the Bible? Fair enough? All right, questions, comments, counter sermons, we good so far? OK, you OK? <laughs> come on, come on, come on, Festa. You want to wait? You too tired to fight with you All right. Uh, <laughs> Well, we have a lucky day here. Let's get something done. <laughs> I just want to learn. All right, all right, fair enough, fair enough. OK, so here we're going to start. So th the name of the book is Kohelet. It's translated into Greek and then into English as Ecclesiastes. Kohelet comes from the word kahal. Kahal means a gathering, OK? Um, the, the book, is you're going to see in a moment, portends to be written by King Solomon. And you'll see why in a moment, because Solomon had two characteristics which make this book remarkable. Number one, he was the richest of all men. And number two, he was the wisest. And if you can have riches and wisdom in the same place, you can carry out a certain kind of thought experiment, which the rest of us will find inaccessible. The other thing that's interesting, though, is that most scholars don't believe this came from King Solomon. In those days, in ancient times, you could assign a book to a character, and you didn't get sued for plagiarism. Um, instead, the word Kohelet seems to imply, um, seems to mean a street preacher. There was a moment when the great empires of the East, um, first Babylon, then Persia, then the Greeks, came and washed over the ancient Near East. And these great empires destroyed and dissolved all of the culture of the villages. If I live in a village, I don't ask the question, what's the meaning of my life? because the village preserves my memory. A village is a bounded place. It's bounded not just to protect it from outsiders. More importantly, it's bounded to, to preserve what's within. In the village, everybody knows who, your who you are. Everybody knows your name and your parents and your grandparents. In the village, every accomplishment is recorded and remembered. In the village, you gain a certain immortality in the collective memory of the village. You know, you are the shoemaker, you are the farmer, you are the mother, the father, the teacher. You had a wisdom, you had extraordinary, you, you count, you matter. What happens when people move from the village to the big city of the empire, to the imperial capital? You end up with something called urban anonymity. Urban anonymity, an urban anomy. That is a sense in which nobody knows me, nobody knows my name, nobody knows I exist, nobody knows that I matter. Nothing I do makes an impression on the world. 
Okay? Nothing I do makes an impression on the world. Who am I really? And then what happens is you had the rise of, of preachers, of street preachers, and sometimes these guys got jobs as the tutors of the sons of the wealthy. And, and what they would do is offer wisdom. Here's how to live your life. Here's how to gain some immortality in this anonymous world. Here's how to live a life that matters. And that's going to be the question that Kohelet asks us. Kohelet looks into the world and he sees nature. And nature is, every, everything in nature is in cycles. Day follows night, follows day, follows night. Winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, right? And the, everything follows, follows cycles and therefore there's no death. Every death in nature is an invitation for rebirth. Think of the myth of the phoenix, right? The problem is that while there's no death in nature, there's also no individual. Because while the individual dies, the species goes on. The hive exists, the nest exists, the herd exists. But the individual's life is extinguished. Um, Lewis Thomas, the great Harvard biologist who wrote about sociobiology, made a comment once where he said, in nature, there is no such thing as an ant. An ant doesn't exist. Ants come in mishpochas, you know, especially when they invade my kitchen, you know. <laughs> they're, they're, the whole mishpocha comes in, right? There's a whole family. There's a whole nest. It, it, it's, it's a social organization. There's no such thing as a bee. Bees are, are, are part of a hive. The individual is extinguished by the cycles of nature. Nature doesn't know from individuals. But we human beings have a deep sense of individuality. So how do you live between those two things? How do you live between the, 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 the cycles of time and that, that extinguishes individuality and my own sense of individuality? So the, the image that Kohelet is going to offer us is something you're all familiar with. If you've ever gone down and spent a couple days at the beach, you go down and spend a couple days at the beach and you sit on your beach chair and you watch, right? Early in the morning comes a crew of kids and they're all excited and they're all full of enthusiasm and they run down to the water and they start making a big, big sand castles, right? And cities and turrets and roads and, and a whole metropolis out of sand. You, know, you ever watch this? And they're just gleeful because it's amazing, right? And they've got buckets and shovels and they've got this whole thing. And then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what happens? The tide, the tide comes in and it washes it away. And the kids go home. And the next day another group of kids comes. And they build another big city out of sand. And then the tide comes in. And by the third day, you get it. <laughs> and you start to say, like Kohelet does, well, here's what he says, right? Utter futility. Utter futility, all is futile. What real value is man and all the gains he makes under the sun? The Hebrew word for futility is hevel. Now, hevel you know from two things. Number one, hevel was the younger brother of Cain. That's Abel. Right? Hevel is something you know because you live in California. It's our weather report nine months of the year. Early morning, low clouds and fog burning off by noon. That's Hevel. Hevel means nothing that lasts. It's going to burn off by noon. It's gone. It's here now, but it's, it's ephemeral, ethereal. Those are good words. Right? It's that which just burns off. And then he says, what value is there for a man in all he gains beneath the sun? The word for value is yitaron. Yitaron is an accounting word. It's a word from accounting. It's what happens when you add up all the debits and all the credits and subtract. Do you have a positive or a negative number? So here is Kohelet's equation. Kohelet's equation is life minus time, or death, equals what? Well, that's the question. Is there anything I can put in for, for, the, for a variable called life? X, that I can devote myself to, which lasts, which has permanence, which has staying power, which, which, which transcends time. Now, for just a moment, think about all the things that people do to transcend time. If your name is Ludwig Beethoven, you write nine symphonies and lots of other stuff, and you live forever, right? I'm afraid if your name is Stephen Paddock, you, you murder nine, 59 people, and now in some perverse way, you live forever too. Or Lee Harvey Oswald, or any of those horrible people, right? What, what, maybe you build a giant building in a big downtown area and put your name at the top. 
Because you have this idea that that's going to that's mm -hmm. defeat death. What you don't know, of course, is that the day you're gone, or they foreclose, they chip your name off and put another guy's name, right? Well, well, that's the question. So these are the, the question is going to be, what are the things that we devote ourselves to that actually lasts? No, that, hang on, hang on. So this is the question. One generation goes, another comes, the earth remains the same forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, it glides back to where it rises. Southward blowing, turning, northward, ever turning, blows the wind. On its round the wind returns. All streams flow into the sea, and yet the sea is never full. To the place from which they flow, the streams flow back again. All such things are wearisome. No man can ever state them. No eye the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear of hearing. Only that shall happen which has happened. The myth of the great return, the great Mandela, the great circle, it all, it, history repeats itself. Only that occur which has occurred. There is nothing new beneath the sun. There is nothing new beneath the sun. You can't add anything new to this because the world is structured in such a way that anything you add will eventually be wiped away by time and the next generation is fated to come and make the same damn dumb mistakes. It's the kids by the seashore. And now he switches from poetry into prose. Sometimes there's a phenomenon of which they say, oh, look, this one's new. Nope, it occurred long ago. In ages that went before us, the earlier ones are not remembered, so too those that will occur later will no longer be remembered than those that will occur at the very end. That's his opening. That's his dun, 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 dun. Right? That's how he opens. He says, here's my problem. I can't find anything worth living for. I can't find anything that makes a substantial difference in the world. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that notice what he defines as worth living for. For him, worth living for means some degree of immortality or eternity. That, for him, is the standard of meaning. That's the standard of, of, of value. The question you might ask is, is that the only standard of value? That's the first question. Well, you might. You might. The second thing is, is, if it is the standard of value, what is he noticing and what, is, what doesn't he notice? What, what is he leaving out of his calculation? Right? Now, you might notice as well, methodologically, he doesn't, he, this comes very, this is like the second to the last newest book in the Bible. The, second, the Bible's finished by the time he writes this. He doesn't quote the Bible anywhere. You'd have expected him to quote the Bible. And, and not only not quote the Bible, but all of the solutions given in the Bible to this question, he sort of ignores. The only evidence he's going to take is what he knows from his own mind. And the question is, is that a limitation? Is that a limitation on his, on his knowing? Is that enough? Or is the book an ironic proof that if that's all you know, you don't know enough? That's going to be one of the questions. So here, here is how the, the book is, nine, is, is 12 chapters. I, I re-edited it for you. Why did I do that? Because I have a lot of chutzpah. I also have a computer. And I can do this on a computer. So I basically re-edited the book. You can read it yourself. And you'll find all of this is there. The Roman numeral is the, is the, is the chapter. And the number is the, um, is the verse. So you can see how I switched around chapters. I sort of skipped around in the book, right? I, Kohelet, was king in Jerusalem over Israel. I set my mind to study and to probe with wisdom all that happens under the sun. An unhappy business, that, which God gave men to be concerned with. I said to myself, here I've grown richer and wiser than any that ruled before me, and my mind has zealously absorbed wisdom and learning. Well, there's two things I want to point out. Number one, why, why does he make himself out to be Solomon? Because Solomon is the wisest of all men and the richest. Because if you were deficient in one of those two things, he might, you might not be able to know. If, if I said to you, if you had Bill Gates' money, you would know why you're alive. <laughs> but as long as you don't have Bill Gates' money, you'll never know why you're alive. You'll say, OK, I accept that. And if I said, if you had Einstein's wisdom, you'd know why you were alive. But here, here's a guy that has Bill Gates' money and Einstein's wisdom. Not bad, right? So he's the perfect cipher. He's the perfect character to ask the question, What's the ultimate meaning of human existence? Now, I want you to also pay attention to how he talks about God. Because the God of Kohelet is very different than any God you've ever met. It's not the God of the Bible. 
in some ways, the God of Kohelet is sort of like the way things are. It's just like that's his, his cipher for the way things are. And he says, look, we're in, the, we're in the world, we human beings, seeking meaning, but we'll never find it. So here's what he's going to do. I'm going to try, he says, I'm going to try a number of experiments. I'm going to try a number of experiments, and I'm going to seek to see which is the right way for a human being to live his life. And I'm going to see if one of these things passes my test. X minus death, or time, equals what? Does it equal a number that's greater than one, or greater than zero, OK? So what's the thing that most people spend most of their time trying to get the most of? Pleasure, Pleasure joy, happiness, money. None is coming. Pleasure, joy, happiness. In America, we have a wonderful three-letter word for this, fun. Right? Think about what people do for fun. Right? Just think about the enormous investment in fun. Right? When I was a kid, Disneyland opened. You know, it was a great thing. We went once every two, three years. We had a drawer full of tickets, A through E, remember? <laughs> right? e, the E's got used up quick. If you, don't, if you, if you didn't understand that reference, you're, you're too young. Right? <laughs> right? But, but in the old days, there were tickets A through E. E were the fancy ones, the E ticket attraction. A, you kept in the drawer, and when you went back, you brought this big, thick, you know, right? Right? How many of those are there? There's now like a dozen of those parks in this area. Like, they, like we needed more, you know? So let's take a look. So pleasure. So here's what he did, right? So he said, I said to myself, come, I will treat you to merriment, taste, mirth. Oy, that too I found was futile. Now here's his story. I ventured to tempt my flesh with wine and to grasp folly while letting my mind direct with wisdom to the end that I might learn which of the two is better for men to practice in their few days of life under heaven. So I'm going to do two things at the same time, which is very hard to do. I'm going to go ahead and enjoy myself to the hilt, but then I'm going to watch myself doing it. There, there's a, there, there was, I, I'm not a tennis player, so tell me if this works. There's a strategy in tennis. If you want to win a tennis match up against an opponent who's much better than you, what you do is you go to him, her, right before the match starts, and you say, show me how you hold your thumb on the racket when you serve. That'll win the tennis match. Because for the rest of the afternoon, that person, <laughs> right? Because if there's one-tenth of your brain watching you do what you're doing, it means that 100% of you is not doing it. You, you see the problem, right? So the question is, so he says, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to enjoy myself, and then I'm going to watch myself enjoying myself to find out if enjoying myself is really the thing that's worth spending a lifetime doing. So the first thing you could ask is, that's not enjoying yourself, right? That, that's like, that's not enjoying yourself. That, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be, right? I, I ventured to tempt my flesh with wine to grasp, all right, I did that right. Um, I multiplied my possessions. I built myself houses and planted vineyards. I laid out gardens and groves. I constructed pools of water. I got slaves. And he gets everything, right? Look down at verse 9. Thus, I gained more wealth than anyone before me in Jerusalem. In addition, my wisdom remained with me. Listen to the next line. This is 10. It's just great. I withheld from my eyes nothing they asked for. Just take that in for a minute. That's the American consumerist dream, right? Walk through the mall, have it all. Have it all. Have it. Whatever you want. Take it. It's yours. Walk through the mall, have it all. Right? I, I, I withheld from my eyes. That's, remember that there was a television program with that obnoxious British gentleman, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Remember him? Yeah? Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Oh, here we are in his beautiful mansion on the island of Yochopitzville, which he owns himself, you know? Remember Richard? Robert, what? Oh, the aptly named Robin Leach, you know? <laughs> To Shmohu Kainhu, yeah. Wow. You know, he has his own plane to go wherever he wants with supermodels coming out of the faucets. I mean, it's, remember that? He puts Perrier on Don Perignon on his cornflakes in the morning, you know, served to him. By, you know, and it was like you watch this and you're like, oh, yes, that's what I want. I want, you know, I, you know, never, you know. I withheld from my eyes nothing they asked for and denied myself no enjoyment. Just, just think of that, right? Now listen to what he says. This is a, such an interesting reflection. It's not Puritan. Puritan would say, shame on you for being so sensual. He doesn't say that. 
I got, rather, I got enjoyment out of all my wealth. But that's all I got out of my wealth. Which means what? That's, that's a beautiful statement, isn't it? Right? There's nothing wrong with having fun. There's nothing wrong with enjoying yourself. There's nothing wrong with a nice meal in a nice restaurant. There's nothing wrong with a nice walk in the park. There's nothing wrong with sensual pleasures, except, yes, except it's not a reason to be alive. It's not, hedonism doesn't work. Why doesn't hedonism work? Hedonism is the, the pursuit of pleasure. We were mourning this week, we're still sitting Shiva for Hugh Hefner, right? Oh, we had Yontif, so I guess it canceled the Shiva, but. <laughs> but if, if you're not that halachic, you know. We're still sitting Shiva. Remember, the, there was a page at the beginning of Playboy that was the page that was the damning page. It was, what sort of man reads Playboy? And it always showed some gorgeous man, you know, and he was always doing something so very cool, and there was always some enormously buxom, beautiful woman looking at him out of the side like, oh, that's the kind of man I would like, you know? And that was our image of masculinity growing up, right? To be a real man, you have to have the best of everything and, and, and have women, you know, oogling you like that, right? What's wrong with that kind of lifestyle? It's a slippery Which means what? It means it's something that nothing will satisfy you. What's the problem? Why, why won't that something satisfy me? Well, but, but wretched excess is nice. I'm, I'd like to try it for a while. Um, <laughs> if, if anyone would like to fund me, I would do... Uh, They'll put a GoFundMe page up and see if someone, the rabbi would like to experience, yes. Right. See, the problem is that whatever experience, it's, the, it's called the cycle of addiction, right? Whatever experience gave you joy today loses its novelty the second time, right? That's what, Hugh Hefner, by the way, was a genius in this. He said this. He said, no matter how gorgeous, luscious, sensual, sexy Miss January is, Guys will always buy the magazine to take a look at Miss February. Because whatever you got, the next one is, it needs to be bigger and better, and, and right? That's called the cycle of addiction. You, know, you need a bigger hit of the drug the next time, right? So, and, and, and if you don't get it, it becomes, it becomes dull, it becomes boring, right? It's the kid who says, I've been to Disneyland already. You know, never, I mean, if you can't have a sense of wonder at Disneyland, right? Yes, please. You do, he doesn't. He, he, he has no satisfaction from you. We'll come to that in a minute. Hang on a minute. All right, number two. Let's, let's move forward. Wealth. The, the second thing that people spend the most amount of their time trying to get the most of is money, but not for the sake of the pleasure it gives them, just for the power of having money. Just for the sense, you know, just for the sense of being a winner, as it were, and this is the way you keep score. Remember the movie Wall Street? Right? The kid asks him, how many boats can you ski behind, you know? And the answer is, it's, not, it's a game and I want to have the most points, right? So he, he, ta he thinks about this and you can see what he says. There's two problems with money. Number one, my thoughts turned to the fortunes my hand had built up, to the wealth I'd acquired. And one, it was futile. For what will be the man like, like what, will be the man, what will the man be like who will succeed the one who's ruling? You can't take it with you. So who do you end up leaving it to? The kids who didn't earn it, who didn't earn, who didn't, don't know the discipline of working hard to earn it. And that's why, you know, these hereditary fortunes typically go to hell, right? Because the second generation doesn't know what the first generation went through in order to, to gain it. And that's a common story, right? Right? And then, so look at the next one. There's an evil I've observed. Sometimes God grants a man riches, property, and wealth, so he doesn't want for anything, but God does not permit him to enjoy it. Instead, a stranger will enjoy it. Right? It's one of the, the jokes in our families. I say to my wife, you know, your next husband's going to have it really easy, you know? <laughs> you know, he's gonna, I gave you all this stuff, right? Right? This is futile and great. If even a man should beget a hundred children and live many years, no matter how many days his years come to, if his gullet is not sated through wealth, I see, says, I said, the stillborn is better, right? And then the other problem is the one at the top of the next page, which is a lover of money never has his fill of money, nor a lover of wealth his fill of income. When does a person say enough? Because once you get into the game of wealth acquisition, 
and you're chasing some sort of, you know, mythical rabbit that, that's your, that, that's success, there's never a point at which you say, I have enough. I can stop. Bill Gates, this notion that, you know, that, 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 that Warren Buffett's gonna, gonna give all of his money to Bill Gates to invest in charity, and, and Gates who's now, I think he's retired from the company, right? And he just does charity all the time. That's very unusual. I mean, usually these guys stay in it forever. So there's, there's no end to it. It doesn't, it doesn't ever stop. So now you say, okay, but that's fine because those are material things. Rabbi, this is the Bible. Let's talk about spiritual goals. And now here is where Kohelet's really going to scare you because he's going to take on the spiritual goals that are at the heart of Jewish existence. The first one is wisdom. And then what can be more important than Talmud Torah? You know, Talmud, learning. We send our kids to school. Every Jewish kid has to go to school, right? Every Jewish kid has to get an A, right? So he, he says, look, I found that wisdom is superior to folly as light is superior to darkness. A wise man has eyes in his head, a fool walks in darkness. In the same way that pleasure is fine because it makes life pleasurable, but it doesn't provide a, a, a reason to be, wisdom is pragmatically useful because it leads you to make better decisions. But the question is, is wisdom a reason to live? Is the pursuit of wisdom the ultimate value, the highest value? He said, I don't think so. Because why? There's two reasons. Number one, I realize the same fate awaits both. So I reflected, if the fate of the fool is also destined to me, to what advantage have I been wise? Now, the number, so the first thing is you can't take it with you. Wisdom doesn't protect you from death. The second problem with wisdom is what? Here's the second problem with wisdom. My dog woke up this morning really happy. I don't know if your dog woke up this morning really happy, but my dog was just charming. I mean, he lived, by, if God ever tells you you have to come back to earth, but you can't come back as a human, come back as an Encino Jewish dog. <laughs> my God. He lives on a pillow, eats steak. I mean, God. And what does he have to worry about? You know, how long his nap will be this afternoon? That's all my dog worries about. Right? I wake up in the morning and I read through new, three newspapers. So by the time I get to my morning coffee, I have a splitting headache. The more you know, the more miserable you are. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, the more you know, the more miserable. Because, because, because the, the more you know about the world, the more of its misery do you, do you imbibe, you know, and so you sort of look at the dog with a certain degree of, a certain degree of, of jealousy, you know? And then you say, you know, I'd, I'd like to, you know, <laughs> you ever have one of these people at a cocktail party? I don't know if you ever had a friend, a par birthday party or a cocktail party, go to a ball game. You know, I took a friend, I said, you're so depressed, come with me to a ball game. We went to a ball game, right? I said, wasn't that a great hit? He looked at me and said, there are refugees. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, but look, look at the game. Watch the game. It's a great game. It's a great game. He says, do you know how many refugees? I said, you, you, like, that person is, you're not going to distract that person. It's, it's, a, it's a mindset. So for, for him, wisdom is both a blessing and a curse. It's a pragmatic blessing because it enables you to live more effectively in the world. But it's a curse because number, it doesn't make you happy. It doesn't give you a sense of peace. It doesn't, and it doesn't give you something that lasts beyond time. So now you'll say, OK. Well, let's get to the thing the whole Bible is about. The whole Bible is about what? Kedusha, about holiness, righteousness, right? Kedoshim tihiyu ki kedosh ani anani. Be holy, says God, right? Do justice. Tzedek, tzedek, tirdo. Do chesed, right? Walk humbly with God. That must be his answer. That must be his answer, right? Here's, it's really going to scare you. Ready? Look at where it says righteousness. You see it? I have observed under the sun. Alongside justice, there is wickedness. Alongside righteousness, there is wickedness. And I mused, God will doom both righteous and wicked, for there's a time for every experience and every happening. The world's a mixture of all this stuff. So how do you live with it? Well, here's what he says. I further, oppressed, I further observed the oppression that goes on under the sun. The tears of the oppressed with none to comfort them and the power of their oppressors. And I accounted those who died long since more fortunate than those who are still living. He says, when you look at the misery of the world, 
and how and 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 the the contrast between oppressor and oppressed. How do you how do you have any sense of relish for life, of joy, of joy for life? A little bit farther. For the same fate is in store for all, for righteous and for wicked, for good and for pure, for the impure, for him who sacrifices and him who does not, for him who is pleasing and him who is displeasing, and for him who swears and him who shuns oath, and that's the sad thing. But if you think that coming to shul is going to change your fate, Kohelet says, listen, I've seen it. It, it, do, it, it, does, it doesn't help. And so finally he says, what? In my, this is the most surprising of all. This one made me scream. Right? In my own brief span of life, I've seen both things. Sometimes a good man perishes in spite of his goodness, and sometimes a wicked one endures in spite of his wickedness. So don't overdo goodness. <laughs> and don't act the wise man to excess, or, and you may be dumbfounded. Don't overdo wickedness. Don't be a chazer. Right? Don't, over, don't be a schmuck. Right? But, and don't be a fool, lest you die. It's best to grasp one without letting go of the other, for one who fears God will do his duty by both. What does that mean? Don't turn the page yet. That's too delicious. The, the whole Bible is about seek righteousness, do justice. And here comes a guy at the end of the Bible and says, not so much. Like, duh, 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 duh. Not, don't, be, don't be too good. Remember Fagan? You know, you've got to pick a pocket or two. Right? You're going to have some kind of a, in this world, maybe in God's idea, you can be 100%, you can be Mother Teresa, right? But given the way the world is, you, you're best to be 90% Mother Teresa and 10% and, and, and Bernie Madoff. No, you know, because that's just the way the, what does he mean by that? Look at, don't overdo goodness. No, don't, don't, because you'll get smushed. Because people who are 100% righteous get smushed. Yeah? That kind of comports with an observation of the real world. It is. And notice, by the way, he's not quoting Bible. He's not even referencing. This is, this is all based on his experience, his empirical experience. When it says beneath the sun, that's what he means. Try to screw somebody else if the deal works out. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, if, he, if the deal works out as planned, he lives by the deal. Right. If it doesn't work out, yeah, well, screw everybody else. I'm in for me. Right. But there's plenty. If the deal works out as planned, I'll still try and screw somebody. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that. I will <laughs> <love> that. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you needed a hug there, Douglas. I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Marcia. My, my daughter once said to me many years ago, and I still listen to her, that life is a window to explore the meaning of the world. Okay, well, I want to come to that at the end. Because you'll see on the last page, I give you Kohelet's answers, Yudha Amichai's commentary, and then I'm going to ask you that question. Like, what's your answer to his question? Because I think that what's happened here is we've, we've been asked a question. And I think it's a remarkable question. And I think it's a, que and it's a good Sukkot question. Because Sukkot is this bittersweet holiday following Yom Kippur, when we've done all this work of tshuva, when someone says, new taco, what's it all about? And I think it's really, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable opportunity to, to reflect on that. Sherry, go ahead. Okay. All right, so one of the questions I'm going to ask you is, what's he missing? And one of the things he's missing is, you said, cultivation of soul. OK? Because cultivation of soul makes you read the world differently than he reads it. OK? So we'll come back to that in a minute. Yes, please. You know, hey, hey, what did he tell the Bible? Because it really reminds me of Ben Franklin, who, you know, was very big on, like, he said, cultivate. Cultivate a good life, and that people won't work here, and you have to be moderate. Right, so, so who is he? He is either the street preacher, but more likely he's the tutor of a wealthy noble, nobleman, right? He's the, he's the old man who has lived well, and he's tutoring this young man, and they get to the question of, I mean, think Aristotle tutoring Alexander the Great, right? And, and the question is, 
all right, what's your life going to be devoted to? And like Franklin, he's going to base it not on scripture, not on religious belief. He's going to base it on his empirical experience. So here you have Douglas, who spent a career practicing business law and has come to certain conclusions about how one succeeds in the world of business law. And what is, you know, what can I expect of people in that world? Right? And that's the basis of his understanding of the world, is his own experience. Much like Franklin, practical wisdom. <coughs> Americans like that thing. You know, good, honest, hardworking, practical wisdom. Common sense, which turns out is not so common in the world. Someone else had a, yes, please, yes. Okay, and that's, that's going to be one of his answers. So if you'll turn the page over, you'll see his answer. So the first answer he stole from Bob Dylan and the Birds, right? <laughs> and, Pete's, and Pete Seeger, right? Yeah, Pete Seeger, right? To everything, turn, 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 there is a season, turn, right? This is where it, it came from, actually came here a little before Pete, right? A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and uproot for slaying and healing and tearing down. What does he mean by that? He means by that, right, th there is no abiding meaning. There's no principle that you attach yourself to. There's a rhythm to life. And there are going to be moments of joy and moments of sadness and moments of accomplishment and moments of failure. And your job in life is to go through those, the rhythms of the life and, and, and cherish each one of them, to find meaning in each one of them, right? And so he gives you the, he gives you the, the prose version of that underneath it, right? What value, then, can a man of affairs gain from what he earns? I've observed the business God gave man to be concerned with. He brings to pass everything precisely at its time. He also puts eternity in their mind without man ever guessing from first to last all the things that God brings to pass. That's a sort of a shtoch to God. He says he gives us the capacity to imagine immortality, but no means to get it. Right? No means to get it. Thus I realize the only worthwhile thing there is is enjoy themselves, and do what is good in their lifetime, and that whatever a man does eat and drink and get enjoyment out of his wealth, it's a gift of God. So you just, in, you know, that's a nice sukkah, kind of a resigned Sukkot thought. Sit in the sukkah and enjoy the family that's around you and the meal that's in front of you, and don't try to think beyond that. That's his idea. And then he gives it to us again. Go eat your bread in gladness and drink your wine in joy, for your action was long ago proved by God. Let your clothes be freshly washed and your head never lack ointment. Enjoy happiness with a woman you love all the fleeting days of life that you've been granted under the sun, for that alone is what you can get out of life and out of the means you acquire under the sun. Whatever's in your power to do, do with all your might, for there's no action, no reasoning, no learning, no wisdom in Sheol where you're going. So at least live it well. If you're going to go and enjoy a meal, enjoy a good meal. If you're going to drink wine, drink good wine. If you're going to make love, make love passionately. If you're going to enjoy the, if you're going to do righteousness, do it with all your heart. If you're going to learn, learn with your whole mind. Don't do it halfway because there's no second chance. Life is not a rehearsal. This is it. And because after this, you're not going to get a chance. So this is his idea. This is his idea of the way that one lives without, this, without a, pr a principle of of eternity, without some notion this is the source of immortality. So here are my three questions. Number one is, do you agree with this? Is this, not a, is, 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 is he missing something? What's he missing? Which means, can we read this not straight on, but can we read it ironically to say, this is a warning about what happens if you don't conclude, include something, right? Why did this get into the Bible? And why is it read on Sukkot? Big questions, and we only have five minutes to answer. You have something. You look like you have something. I could yeah. just sort of tell on your face. Oh, <laughs> look, I, I, I think your explanation of Kohelet was uh, brilliant as usual. Uh, you basically and there's a but answered coming. every question <laughs> that a person could have yeah. about Kohelet, right, right in these two pages. There you go. However, ah. <laughs> there, is, uh, there is an engine which drives the entire biblical theology to its 
inequitable conclusion. Right. And that conclusion happened exactly when this was written. Not Solomon, but somewhere between 450 and 180, somewhere in that range when it was written. There was a man who tutored Alexander, Aristotle. Right. And he came through and he met this guy. And he changed forever the way Judaism would imagine the world. Mm -hmm. Because there are, the, the question that is the end here is why do the righteous suffer? And, and it's an engine which constantly reimagines Judaism because of its, what Hegel calls a dialectic. The first solution is, well, we suffer in this world because we sin, our rewards and are in this world, our punishments are in this world, and they're collective. Mm -hmm. It's the whole community that, so then the temple is, the north is destroyed in 722, the south in 586, and people say, we cannot believe that, the dialectic is moved on, and so there must be a new solution, because we cannot believe that collectively we deserve this catastrophe. In this world. In this world. Right. The, the next solution is Ezekiel who says, Ish Yamut, says, Ish, now, now it's no longer collective. It's still this world, yeah. but it's individual. Right. Each person will live and die by their own sin. Right. All right, so the problem with that is seen in two books. This is one of them, yeah. and the other is Job. Right. They both say, okay, so what happens when there's an individual righteous man, and he suffers? It violates the whole system. Right. And that moves the dialectic on. But there was no solution to it right. until Aristotle came and taught itinerant teachers called Pharisees who later would become rabbis who would write a new religion called Judaism, which would birth another religion, Christianity and Islam, and change the world. And that idea was matter and form. The idea of potentiality, matter, and form actuality. The idea was the world isn't just simple, uh, made up of stuff. Yeah. It's made up of two principles. And one is the principle of things changing, and the other is a world of ideas, which makes the stuff what it is. But the world of ideas are eternal and immaterial. And what that, so the, the Pharisees, these, these Jews, who had no solution to the next step of the dialectic of why do innocent people suffer. They see, my God, here it is. Matter will be goof. Body. Form will be neshama. <coughs> soul. Soul. Right. right. And all of a sudden, there's a reason to live. Right. And their fates are not the same. Right. And Sheol is not the destiny of all people. Right. Because after you die, Right. Your soul lives on in the olam haba. Okay. It was the solution to Ecclesiastes. It is the solution to Job. And it is a solution that they didn't have. And it is, I know, your intention yeah. to include that solution, which you have for reasons which are, I must admit, at the moment, bewildering to me, <laughs> you have not included until this Yes, moment. that's right. I waited till the last moment. <laughs> Why was it included in the Bible, though? Because it was 331 when Aristotle came as the tutor of Alexander. Before then, before then, this was the greatest intellectual transformation in the history of mankind. Yeah, but you see, but, but the, so my question so they is... they didn't is, have the tools. Yeah, but why would you include a book that undermines everything else in the Bible? Because the book says the dialectic must move forward. The idea of each okay. person will die to their own sins, righteous people do well, wicked people are punished, is wrong. Okay. It's okay. wrong. All right, so and Ecclesiastes knew that. Well, let me just give a Rashi to this. So, 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 so the, the reason, the, the book is an evidence of something. When we say the word Bible, we assume that's a book with an author with a point of view. And if it's not one author with a point of view, fine. It's a bunch of authors with a point of view because it wouldn't be in the book if it didn't share that point of view. 
Typically, you don't put ideas in a book which contradict all the other ideas in a book. But that's not the editorial principle of the Bible. Because if it were, this book shouldn't be there. You can't have kedoshim tihiyu. You will be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And a guy who says, don't overdo goodness. <laughs> right? You just can't have those two ideas. So what you get in the Bible is an evidence of, of, a, of, a, of a conversation, of an ongoing debate about the principal issues of being human, not a singular point of view. And what Rabbi Gelman is pointing out is that this book comes at the verge, at the, at the, just at the precipice of a brand new idea that's going to show up and save Kohelet from his bewilderment, right? which is why they probably added the last line. The last line is clearly not part of Kohelet. But somebody added it. And they added it not just to, to put a stamp of kosher on what was otherwise an awfully trafe book, but because that really was, in the end, the idea that if you keep the, Torah, you keep the Torah's commandments and fear God, then what w the answer to the question is, is life in another world or the cultivation of soul, the, 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 the perfection of soul. And that, that then makes the book a sort of ironic statement, because what it says is, you can't know that from looking into the world. The world is not going to teach you to live a righteous life. The world's going to teach you what, jo what Douglas said is, is, you know, be careful, but don't be, it, 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 it's not, the world is not set up to teach you righteousness. You're going to have to use a, a, a perception which is above your normal empirical perception of the world. So many of the orthodox commentators on this, and I looked them up, take a lot of stock in that phrase, everything I saw beneath the sun. And they say, what is that takat Hashemesh? What do you mean takat Hashemesh? It's not just a phrase. What he's trying to say is that, that our normal empirical experience of the world isn't sufficient to tell us the real nature of reality. Because what we're looking for is something that's above that, above the sun, as it were. Above something more powerful than that, which is this notion of olam haba. That's one way of answering Kohelet's question. Thank you. That was very beautiful. That was very nice. Ronnie. I'm not done. I'm going to give you more in a minute. All right, so let, let's take that up because that's something interesting. So we, we looked at this last year when we looked at the book, and I want to just mention it again because I think it's important. If you go through the sections, and, and I didn't edit this badly. I mean, I, I didn't take this out on purpose. But you'll notice something really interesting. The whole book is presented in first person singular, OK? First person singular, which means that what he's saying is, if I walk the world alone, this is as much as I can expect to get out of life. What's missing is something that's so obvious to us, you might even not, not even see it, which is the social context, which means other people. Other people. And for him, other people only exist as objects of his desire or as tools for his needs. In other words, I-it relationships, right? He, this really is Hugh Hefner, you know, who, who cherishes women only because he uses them for objects or, or projections of his ego or objects of his own pleasure. The, the sad thing is, by the way, th this was on Scott Simon from the NPR did the report on Hefner's death, and he said the sad thing was in the last years they would have these wild parties at the house, but he didn't stay for them. He would greet his guests and go back upstairs and sit in his room by himself. And when he died, he died alone. He died alone. That's an interesting phrase, right? What sort of man dies playboy? You know, interesting. So now take, take, take Kohelet and go back and rerun his four experiments, adding the element of a social context. Number one, pleasure. Right, pleasure. All I got from my wealth was, well, all I got from my wealth was my pleasure. But you know what? Pleasure shared is a very different experience than pleasure had, right? Disneyland is a nice place to visit. Disneyland with a five-year-old is oh. just the most wonderful experience in the world. Six, sorry, sorry, Sam West. Sorry, bro. S S Disneyland with a six-year-old because something happens there, right? Wealth. Wealth for myself is one thing. Wealth as a tool for touching the world is a different thing, right? Go backwards. Righteousness. This is the one that, that, that bothers me the most. I don't know if you saw this. So if you look at the second one, I further observe all the oppression that goes on under the sun. 
the tears of the oppressed with none to comfort them, and the power of the oppressor. What do you mean with none to comfort them? You're the richest guy in the world. You have enough money to build this Garden of Eden that you built? Take some of that money, schmuck, and go do something with it, right? When he says, alongside justice, there's wickedness, and alongside righteousness, there's wickedness. But what doesn't happen is the wickedness doesn't seem to touch him. It doesn't claim him in any way. He doesn't feel responsible to attack, to, to, touch, to, to ameliorate it, to do anything about it. So you have a man who lives in a, as an island. He lives as a, in a bubble. He lives separated from the social context. And he says to you, in that social context, in that so, you know, social acontextuality, a social island, I feel no reason to be alive. That's what Genesis said. That's why God said, lo tov heyot adam livado. You can't live your life alone. Now, the, uh, to me, the fun part is the, ne is the last one, is the third one, is wisdom. Right? Because he says, what good is wisdom? Well, let me ask you a question. If you really think everything is futile and the world will never change, why do you write a book? Most people write books because they think that the accumulated wisdom of their lifetime might actually change the life of another human being. Duh. You know, that's why you write a book. And so to me, the irony of the thing, and I, I don't disagree with Rabbi Gelman because I think historically he's exactly right. The book is here because it's on the precipice of the next revolution in Jewish thought, which was Olam Haba, the idea that this isn't the only world. But I think in its own context, I would suggest this, that, that I do like to read the book ironically. That is to say, I think they put it in here not because of what it says, because of what it doesn't say. And to me, the greatest ir irony of the thing it doesn't say, and it's funny to put a book in because what it doesn't say, but somehow you have to have all this book in order to say what it doesn't say, is very simple. The man said is, nothing you can do in the world will ever get you remembered by anybody. We're reading this book. <laughs> 3,300 years after he wrote it, we're reading his book. Or 2,300 years after he wrote it, we're reading his book. What does that mean, we're reading his book? It, it means that there is something you can do. You can add to the accumulation of wisdom of humankind. You can, and we, we have a word for that. We call that Torah. You call that Torah. Torah, which is teaching. Now, to me, that's, that's the reason why the rabbis said, that on the Shabbos before Simcha's Torah, I want you to read this book. Because I don't want you to finish reading the Torah on Wednesday night, or Thursday night, without taking into consideration what Torah really is. Which is, in a different way than what Rabbi Gelman described, Torah is the immortality of the Jewish people. Because we all join the conversation. Please. Does that feel to you as if this is a midlife crisis? Oh, yes. End of life crisis. Yeah, yeah, you don't. So, so the, the tradition, when they read this, the traditional scholars, when they read this, said, this is written by Solomon, OK? Solomon, they said, wrote three books in his life, right? Shira Shirim he wrote when he was a young man, right? Proverbs he wrote when he was middle-aged, at his, at his prime, and Kohelet as an old man. So what is Kohelet as an old man? Remember Eric Erickson, the great developmental psychologist? And remember his, his, his great, his, his great, um, his great eight ages of man? And he says, at the end of life, we all face this terrible choice, this terrible task between uh, integrity or despair. Integrity or despair. Integrity means I look back at my life and I see that it has a message. It says something. It exists in the world as a statement of a value that's bigger than me. And despair is I look at my life and there's nothing there. It's hevel, it's, it's futility, it's, it's, it's ethereal, it just floats away. And, and it's exactly right. This, it's not a midlife crisis, it's an end of life crisis. It's, it's a man looking back at his life and saying, what does it come to? What does it come to? And, and asking himself, what, if he's talking to his young student, what do you devote yourself to that makes a life worth living? Okay? 
What do you devote yourself? And his, in the end, he says, there's nothing. Just enjoy the flow of life. We've devoted, we've asked ourselves that question and come to different conclusions. And that ironic reading of the book, the different conclusions we might draw, is, is exactly, the th I think, what the meaning of the book is. I think that's the meaning of the book. Um, go home and ask yourself why you're alive. <laughs> and come back next week. We'll do this again, OK? <laughs> Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thanks. That was great. Woo. The, uh, the all of Aristotelian Judaism. Let me go through. Anytime you can get over there, he just loves having company. You know, it's just a joy for him. And it's